it's kind of like I said, I was disappointed with uh, losing when we got behind and then game we, sh- we probably should have won and then got ourselves in front and then he comes on and kicks a winning uh, kicks a winning drop goal. Absolutely delighted for him. But I, I rang him yesterday and just said I've been to the been to the lawyers and you're out of the will. So <laughs> you know we had a bit of a laugh. So in this interview, I talk to the best in the business, hands down, coach Warren Gatland. We talk about a number of things, mainly about his new book, Pride and Passion. I listened to the audio version. It took me a while, but quicker than reading the book. And that's more on me than on him. Really interesting guy. Opens up emotionally about his family, about his experiences, everything from being burnt in Ireland all the way up to where he finds himself now, back home in New Zealand. You don't want to miss this one. Touch on Bryn briefly, because oh, having, yeah. ha- having listened to the book and um, kind of have this idea of, of how you coach and the emotions and stuff like that, and you watch from afar, but how was that seeing your son, one, take the field, because he's had a long layoff with injury, but obviously dropping the goal to win. And there's a professional element to that, but from reading your book, there's also family is number one. Uh, how, how was that after? Kind of mixed feelings, really. It kind of, uh, it's great that he got on and he's, um, he's been working so hard to get back from, from injury and stuff. And we went out for dinner on Friday night, uh, Trudy and, and um, Bryn and myself. And I got a text during dinner and the text said, oh, that uh, the, First five or the out half for the Highlands was was out. And I looked at him, I went, are you on the bench tomorrow? And he went, yeah. And I, he said, oh, I wasn't going to tell you. And I went, oh, okay. So I said, when did you know? He said, oh, Thursday. So this is Friday. So then we went to, had a joke. And then he, he said, oh, I'll come on tomorrow and kick the winning drop goal. And uh, so um, it's kind of, like I said, I was disappointed with uh, losing when we got behind and then, game we, sh- we probably should have won and got ourselves in front and then he comes on and kicks a winning uh, kicks a winning drop goal. Absolutely delighted for him but as a competitive person I have it took me a little bit of time to get over the disappointment. Uh, saw Trudy in the in the tunnel afterwards and she saw my face and obviously that you know that I wasn't too happy with the with, with the result and so I think she wanted to jump up and down and uh, and celebrate but she sort of kept her her emotions in check and so it's like everything yeah you're disappointed at the time then you have a few days to reflect and as a team um probably monday you, you, you know it's like you're coming after a um after a loss and everyone's a little bit subdued and then tuesday we were much better and we sort of a bit of banter and um at training and stuff so um yeah i kind of started to focus on on this weekend's match and but, you know, as a dad, um, you know, pretty proud of him. He's, he's done that on a few occasions, actually. He's kicked the winning drop goal. He did that in a school's final New Zealand um, championship and then did it at a club game, a big club game. And then he did it for North Harbour against the Targa down on the same ground to to win the, um, for, for a Targa and, and, and a final. So, um yeah, he loves those situations, loves the pressure. And, and that's, you know, so from, from a dad, you know, really proud of him. But um, as a coach, kind of uh, disappointed we lost the game. So, you know, you've got to, it's just, uh, you're putting things in perspective, really. Well, it's brilliant. As a narrative and as a neutral watching, it was great that one rugby was back, but secondly, the finish and obviously. Oh, great. Yeah, great emotion, wasn't it? Kind of like, you, you couldn't have scripted it to... If you any any better, if you were a, a a pundit, you know, particularly. So um, it's uh, and that's what sports all about. I love that sort of, uh, and we'll probably have a laugh over it. I, I rang him yesterday and just said, I've been to the been to the lawyers, and you're out of the will. So you know, we had a, bit of a laugh. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Uh, well, we'll come on to your book because I said the last six or seven hours um not all of us all in one i've slept in between but last night and this morning i've been listening to it so i feel like i know you uh, properly <laughs> but uh, pride and passion i was listening to the narrated version by paul haley so i was just pretending that was you because he's a kiwi yeah. as well isn't he so uh, no but yeah. it's brilliant but f- for someone and you and you say it yourself quite early on as a shy man and the exterior that you have 
how difficult was it um, to go back through the emotional archives, dig up some old ground? Yeah, it's, it's, it was a real challenge because you're talking about 50 years of experience, you know, as uh, starting rugby as a five-year-old and then how do you sort of, what do you prioritise and what things do you cover and, and, and trying to make sure you, you don't miss out certain aspects of, of your life and your rugby experiences and the importance that that had. So, look, it was, it was a challenge. I'm really happy with the way that it that turned out and, you know, if I missed out recognising people, it was, you know, that was kind of kind of tough. But, yeah, for me, the, the biggest part was how do you put in the, uh, your time in New Zealand and then um, club rugby, provincial rugby, all black experiences, time in Ireland, time in London, time in Wales. Um, <clears throat> you know, all those things are kind of, you know, and trying to fit it into, you know, you give them so many words that you can write. And uh, so that was kind of, um, you know, like I said, a, a, a real challenge around that. But really happy with um, you know, how, how the final outcome came and and just trying to be trying to be as, as upfront and honest as I possibly can be. I, I, I realise, you know, like I am a, a reasonably private person and, and then there's a lot of people out there who have a, a perception of me, um, which is fine and kind of seen as this um, uncompromising sort of almost like unfeeling sort of person, which is, and that's, and I don't have a problem with that, but, but the people who know me, um, you know, friends and close friends and family know that I'm kind of a lot different to um, the perception or the persona that a number of people portray me as. Yeah, absolutely. The thing, you know, there's a couple of things that stick out for me. And again, you know, I'm still a fairly young man, but in terms of watching you in your career, and like you said, the kind of perception that you have, you know, the pinnacle for a player, the player in the UK being the boss of, British and Irish Lions, but you know, two of the things that really stick out for me, and the one that we can talk about now, is how fondly uh, you speak about your family, your relationship with your father, your children, and truly your wife as well. Um, was it quite nice going through them things of your career and your life as a, as, as a young lad? And you know, there's a really sad story in there. I don't want to talk too much about it, but about the loss of your child as well, which um, I found very emotional as well, having four children myself. So. But how was it actually going through and talking about your family and, and you know recalling events? Yeah, it was it was incredibly emotional, emotional, and and kind of for me that's um, you know family's become a real priority with um, teams that I've coached, you know, particularly in <clears throat> oh, I, don't know, I suppose the last ten years. Um, I would talk about you know how lucky we are to be involved in, in rugby and, and professional rugby, and but always stress to players that, you know, um, how, how important family is. And, and, and even though we are involved in professional sport, that family comes first. And the reason I'm saying that is that, that if things are right at home and we get the right environment and players are happy and partners are happy and children are happy, then I, then I get a better product uh, at training. I get a better product in terms of performance on the field as well. So, um, so yeah, look, um, you know, over a long period, uh, you know, very lucky in terms of how close we have been as, as a family and, and the experience that we've had uh, traveling around the world and uh, the opportunities that we've had had as well. And, you know, like very, very emotional in, in terms of that. Um, and, I, and I just, um, you know, we're incredibly close as a family and very, very supportive of each other. And, um so those those things you know definitely resonate with me in, in 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 terms of how I wanted to express that in the book. But um, but I think players that have have been coached by me, um, I know a lot of coaches they they talk the talk but they don't walk the walk, and it's really important that yeah, you know if you if you're honest about that and you and you do express you know the importance of family and relationships and. And, and friends and and whatever that you you've got to you've got to live through that you've actually got to adhere to it in terms of making sure that you that you if you talk about it then you've got to deliver on, on that and and I'd like to think um, that I've been that I've been true to my word and I, I'm probably a little bit different to a lot of coaches and and I'm conscious that I think um, how important players are to your squad and and 
I think there's a lot of sports, sometimes, you know, probably football and, and, and I hope rugby doesn't get that, that players are sometimes, I think, is seen as a commodity, almost like a, a piece of meat and you know, they can be, and, I, and I, don't, I don't see that. I try to have a different view in that. I think players, players come first and I try and put, put my squad first and oft, often talk to players and I know players sometimes have opportunities to, to go somewhere else and, and you know, some, you know, financially it might be great. And, and one of the things that I always say to the players is that you've got to make the best decision for you and your family. And that's really, really important. Yeah, well, absolutely. But, you know, the family stuff comes over massively <laughs> early on in the book as well. One of the other things as well that I picked out, and this is just me, this is just the way that I listened to it, um, was your take on integrity, right? And there's a couple of things. One was your career as a player and kind of how that ended in Waikato. And then the other kind of headline one was probably your time in Ireland um, with Eddie O'Sullivan and I have no idea. So I, I only see, I know that you coached Ireland, and, but I know you more for Wasps and Wales and the Lions. That, I, I had no yeah. idea actually listening back and, and delving through the archives. So how was that actually digging up that kind of old ground? Because that can be a little bit tetchy. We know, you know, looking back and Googling it, they're the ones that make the headlines. But some people will kind of gloss over all the other stuff and they'll just be looking for the headlines. And you probably knew that when you were going to dig these out. Yeah, well, I think the thing for me, my experience in Ireland, and I've got some great friends still from um, our, our time in Ireland, and I'm indebted to them, you know, for the opportunities. I mean, I was coaching Ireland at 34 years of age, um, and it wasn't a job that you had any security about. I think it was about, I think I was the ninth coach in the in the in the 90s or something. So I kind of was asked. Uh, it was actually Brian Ashton. We'd lost, um, ironically at home, um, Ireland lost at home uh, the first game to Scotland and Brian Ashton resigned afterwards. So I get a phone call on the Sunday saying would I prepared to coach um, Ireland for the remainder of the Six Nations. And was I ready for it? No. Um, but sometimes you get those opportunities in life and, and you, don't, you don't turn them down. And, and I learned so much about the four years that I was involved um, with Ireland during those times. And, uh, you know, really, uh, I think it was that, that grounding of those experiences that really have made me such a better coach from when I moved on from Ireland to to Wasps and then back to Waikato and then um, and then to Wales and then and then time with the the Lions and stuff. So look, yeah, look, it was it was tough um, when I was replaced by by Eddie Sullivan, and I've always said that technically I thought he was a good coach, and I, I questioned some of his man management skills and. And I kind of, when I look back now and I go, you know, there's only been one winner in, in that debate and, uh, you know, he's he's not in, in coaching anymore. And when he finished with, with Ireland, he, he struggled in, in, in jobs and, and 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 found it difficult to, you know, to get coaching positions. So, look, I, I kind of look back and, and I don't have any hard feelings about that. What, what disappoints me at, at times is that people would, you know, say that, Oh, you know, the, the Brian O'Driscoll situation that I kind of, you know, was leaving Brian O'Driscoll out of the, the third test against Australia for the Lions. It was kind of, you know, I was trying to punish the Irish for, for my experiences there. I mean, that would, those kind of things, you know, when you're a coach and you're desperate to win a game, you don't think about those things. And, um, and you know, people th were at times thinking I was anti-Irish. Never been anti-Irish because I've got some great friends. And like I said, uh, the opportunities that they gave me, um, I can't express how lucky I was um, and the time that I had there. And the, like I said, the great friends that we made, the experiences. Um, Bryn learned to talk in Ireland, so he had a really strong Irish accent until he was about 13 or 14. And the people we talk to him now when they first meet him, they think, where did you, you know, he's still got a, that, a little bit of that twang. Um, so, you know, that's kind of special. And then Shauna was born in Ireland. So that uh, for us is kind of, you know, where I first had my chances uh, when the game went professional and, and they gave me a chance to, to coach professionally, you know, initially with Connacht and then, and then with Ireland. So um, special times and, you know, um, but through disappointment or through adversity, you kind of it makes you stronger and you learn from those situations and I definitely learn from the experiences I had at such a young coach coaching international rugby and that definitely 
gave me a, a great grounding and, and I learned so much from that and definitely made me such a better coach going forward um, from from that time that I had there. One of the funny, I did laugh, I don't know whether I should have laughed at this point, but I lived in Northern Ireland for uh, five or six years. My dad was in the military, my sister was born in a place called Antrim just outside Belfast, but where you talk about the letter that you received um, from, uh, let's say, a Northern Irish organisation, the Red Hand of Ulster, which was stamped at the bottom, bottom of the letter. I don't know whether I should have laughed or creased, I couldn't believe it, but... I think you dealt with that side of things. You, had to, you were coaching in Ireland in quite a, I'd say probably past the, the, the real troubled times, but having an understanding uh, of how you, how you deal with them kind of situations. Because it's still a thing now. I spoke to uh, Rory Best about it, and it's not a thing within the playing uh, fraternity, but you know the relationship with the media that you speak uh, a lot about as well. But it's the media that portray this kind of them and us in terms of Ireland and Northern Ireland. I think you dealt with that quite well. Yeah, and I think I think for for me, um, one of the things that 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 I'm really conscious about is so who have gone into a um, coaching wherever that's been is that not surrounding myself with Kiwi coaches and stuff. You've got to have such an element of, of local people involved in your environment because they become your eyes and ears. And and I was like, I loved I loved history at school and. Um, and at, you know, I did history at university and, and courses and stuff, and I was very lucky to um, do Irish history as, as part of it. And so coming to to Ireland and having some understanding of of the past and you know, the, the you know, different movements that were going on and what, what was happening in the north and the south, um, that, that understanding was was really really important. And 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 when you go to an area. It's important you do your homework. You know, you do your homework in your history and you understand a lot of things. You know, what you read in the books and what you learnt, you know, wasn't always 100% accurate because you get different views and different people and stuff. And you know, bringing people together from one island with different backgrounds and stuff, um, like there's never any issues in the team, and and the team was different. But when it really came down to it, you know, there was some cultural and obviously political differences and you got to you got to accept that and I think the players understood that you know they understood that that, that, that players had come from a different background and a different upbringing and, and they respected that um, and you look it was quite funny at times we had a few laughs on the bus when uh, you know the boys from the south were singing a nation once again and as a joke and then uh, the boys from northern uh, northern Ireland were saying the, the bell of Belfast city or something so Look, they understood, and 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 I think that's really um, really positive in terms of that integration, you know, and, and understanding people's different views and 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 the pressures that people come under, you know, obviously, particularly in Ireland with the, the national anthem and and players and and obviously not you know not singing it, but it's the obviously the consequences of of what happens are around that, and and people are you know a lot more. I, I suppose, you know, socially aware or, or aware of, of the differences and, and, you know, obviously and with, um, um, you know, and, and the, I suppose the acceptance um, of, of those differences is much more relevant now than, it, you know, perhaps was, you know, 20, 30 years ago and even even a little bit longer. Um, so, yeah, look, it was... It was um, interesting times and, and getting a letter like that and having to give it to hand it over to the police and you know I think the, I remember the first line you know you buy us bastards from the south and you know not not selecting enough players from Ulster uh, and we know where you live sort of thing um, you know I, I, how seriously did I take it you kind of you know you're a little bit worried as a, as a young man but um, you know they, they, these things happen and I'm not sure that yeah, the same sort of thing would happen, hopefully, in today's environment. Uh, take you to the Lions tour in New Zealand, right? Um, and you spoke about Brian, Brian O'Driscoll, the big decision with him in Australia to drop him for the final test and everything that's gone before that. Just, just quickly, how much pressure did you feel going home on that tour? I, I think we kind of got a sense for it, but I think that more people around the world in the rugby community, from whether they're players, media, supporters 
the respect they probably had for you at the end of that tournament. I mean, it was a draw. It felt like a victory. And for you, it probably yeah. didn't feel like a victory. But how much pressure was there? And how emotional was that going home with the Lions team? It was hard. It was kind of, um, I, I suppose, my, my first reflection was I was, I was naive. Um, and I was naive because I had this romantic view of uh, a Kiwi, an ex-All Black, uh, leading the Lions to come home to New Zealand and that the fans would be brilliant, we'd have a celebration of rugby and, and rugby would, you know, everyone would enjoy the rugby and that. And then I kind of had some, right from day one, really, some sort of uh, a certain section of the media, some, some personal attacks on me and perhaps trying to... Um, unsettled me and, and stuff and and I, I found that challenging it's not something that I, I was really conscious that I didn't um, show any emotion to that anyone saw that from uh, the other coaching staff or the players or anything like that and it, and it probably actually galvanized me and, and motivated me even even more to want to be want to be successful so um, that that was that was for me was the hardest thing about the tour but um, what was brilliant was the hospitality that we received in New Zealand, the New Zealand public, and um, there are other aspects of the media. I thought they, they treated us exceptionally fairly. Um, wherever we went, we, you, know, you go to the games and, and the crowd and the atmosphere was just unbelievably amazing. And people were saying, good luck today, all the best. And um, so... Um, yeah, it was it was hard at times, but when I when I look back on it, you know, the number of emails and letters I received from New Zealand fans afterwards, just saying, you know, well done on the tour, and and we were embarrassed by, you know, the personal treatment that you had by certain aspects of of the media, and and I really appreciated that. It kind of was, uh, and it wasn't, um, you know, that some of that treatment definitely wasn't reflected about of the experiences that we were having as a squad in New Zealand because they were incredibly, incredibly positive. Yeah, it was it was a hard tour. It was the first real tour where you went and there wasn't one or two games where you felt um, you, you could probably have a couple of light days of training where you're going to, you know, easy, you know, perhaps um, win reasonably comfortable. That's probably what's happened in previous tours. You know, to think that you go... To New Zealand, you're playing the five Super Rugby franchises, three Tests, and New Zealand marries them, and that's kind of uh, unheard of as a challenge. And so, look for what we did and, and reflection. You know, I think we're incredibly proud. And I know we drew the third Test, but I think the great thing about that third Test and, and looking back on it is that we ended up with probably for me is going to be one of the iconic photos of all time when you see both teams on that rostrum and. Sam Warburton and Kieran Reid holding that trophy aloft. I, I just think that's what sport's all about. It's, uh, what, to me, it wasn't about the result in the end. It was about that picture and um, people from different nations just standing together and, and enjoying each other. I know disappointed that there wasn't a final result, but that just, to me, epitomised what sport's all about and particularly what rugby's all about. I think you're at a point now without speaking for you in your career, everything that you've done, you're back in New Zealand, surely there must be a burning desire one day to coach the All Blacks. It's not, it's not something that I... Um, I've, ne I've never been a one for planning my future and never, you know, I was kind of being a great believer in what will be will be and, and the opportunities will, will come along. And I'm not sitting here and thinking, OK, what do I have to do over the next few years to be the All Black coach? It's, kind, it's definitely not... It's, it's a day-to-day -day thing and... And wherever you go, if you're successful, then opportunities come along. And I've been lucky enough that I've been successful you know, with teams in the past. And if you are successful, then someone comes knocking on your door and, and um, you know, gives you an opportunity or asks if you, if you want to take an opportunity. So, you know, that's kind of the way that I'm looking at it, that you know, over the next few years, it's not about wanting to be the All Black coach. It's saying, let's do the best I can. Um, the remainder of this season, obviously, with the Lions, that becomes really important. Going to South Africa, you're playing against the world champions. And then I've got a couple of, couple more years of um, contract with, with the Chiefs back in New Zealand with Super Rugby. And then if I'm successful, then potentially other opportunities will come along. But definitely not, it's not 
a burning desire. It's not a, it's not one of, it's not a plan that I'm kind of um, try, a road that I'm trying to take and how do I um, position myself to, to do it. It, it. It's a result of you doing the best job that you can in the moment. And if you do that, then, then other things potentially come along. Yeah, absolutely. Just lastly, on the Lions and to, to South Africa, uh, they are the world champions, we know. Um, Scottish players, there must be more than Stuart Hogg now that put themselves in, the shop, in the shop window. Yeah. Jamie Ritchie, uh, Hamish Watson. Yeah, yeah look, I, I am really, really conscious and I understand um, it's, it's important that we have a representation of, of the four home nations and that's, that's, that's really, really important to me and, and I know that um, we're so every nation is so parochial, and and that's understandable. And there's disappointment and disagreement about about selection. Uh, and I want to have a, a good representation of Scottish players. I desperately want that to happen, and I, and I hope that does it does happen. And um, and it's important we do select players from from every nation. And I think that's it's something that. The last thing you want to do is go on a Lions tour and not have um, one or two nations or, or you know, or no players from Scotland. Um, so look, it's I know last time we created a certain amount of amount of controversy, and I've learnt a lot, you know, a heck of a lot in the, the tours that I've been on, and and you reflect back and you think, you know, what things that you would do differently, and I know a lot of times that. The finger gets pointed directly at me, and you know, I was kind of like I've made the decision. And I can tell you that, you know, as as five coaches in Australia, we were unanimous about um, the address school decision. Um, you know, but obviously a lot of uh, finger pointing was up myself, and and same with the um, same with you know the selection of um, a couple of Scottish players in the last tour. So. Um, look, I'm, I'm conscious, and I really, like I said, I desperately want them to do well. And, and when I look back in in 2017, um, probably the hardest thing was that you, when you're playing away from home, you want players to front up away from home and be able to win win away from home. That becomes important, you know, particularly online. So you're playing against Southern Hemisphere team away from home, and probably um, the big game. Uh, and I didn't expect them to win, but I, w- I wish they hadn't shipped 50 points, you know, against England at Twickenham. You know, that was probably not a great performance for a number of individuals. And it's great to see that they started um, the Six Nations so well. And it was a you know, great performance again. You know, I thought they played pretty well at the first couple of games. And, you know, the good performance against Scotland. Uh, sorry, against uh, France. Uh, you know, really, really important win. And I think they would have gone to Cardiff with that with that, uh, with a lot of confidence, and you know that, that to win away from home and win in Cardiff, which they haven't done for a long time, you know that, that to me that's a significant result. And um, you know, the next twelve months, as we get closer towards the Lions, um, I want I want all those teams to be able to to perform well and 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 make for us, you know, selection difficult. And and like I said, I'm really conscious about that, and we need to make sure that we have a balance from the four home nations and and that that is, that is important yeah no absolutely uh, warren just finally um the telegraph your book has been shortlisted for sports book of the year but you're up against uh, sam warburton rory best doddy weir dylan hartley your great rival eddie jones and also um i don't know whether ben mercer is going to be shortlisted on the telegraph one but i did an interview with him a young lad who played pro two rugby over in france and his book has been making waves in Amazon, but your rivalry with Eddie Jones on the book front, do you want to beat him? (laughs) (laughs) Um, He's always, he's a great competitor. Uh, Look, we we understand that sometimes the media make a few, um, make a mountain out of a molehill about, you know, things that we might say, Um, you know, we've been out for dinner a number of times and and we realise it's a game sometimes, you know, it's just, it's part of, part of the sport. So, um, I think if uh, one of us books happen to to be lucky enough to to win and get the accolade, then well, the other one will have to buy him dinner, and and maybe maybe a couple of glasses of red wine as well. So uh, look, he's 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 very much like me in terms of he's been with 
England for a while now and sign up to the next World Cup, he would have learned um, in each campaign a lot about the experiences that that he's been through, and I'm sure he's learned um, a lot from you know what happened to them in the World Cup, and you know he'll get better for that, and, and England as, as a squad will be better for that as well. So look, yeah, there's, there's definitely um, a huge amount and a lot of rivalry between us, but I'd like to think there's a, a huge amount of respect too in terms of um, you know what we've both achieved in the game. Yeah, no, absolutely. Warren, thanks so much for talking to me. Good luck for the season. Obviously, the Lions tour and with the book as well. And as I say, I spent hours listening to it and it was, it was fantastic. I'm not just saying that because I've got you on camera. It, it was brilliant. So, no, I really appreciate you sharing all that with, uh, with us all out here. Yes, thanks, Jim. Great talking to you. Thanks, Gats. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate.